What would you do if three men on camels arrived at your house and handed you gifts of myrrh, gold, and frankincense? <coughs> You'd be pretty weirded out, right? Unless you were the Holy Family in Bethlehem in year one. In the 21st century, we have some amazing traditions and liturgical moments to pray alongside. So let's dive right in. Welcome back, my dear brothers and sisters. Thank you for joining me for Bible Basics with John Bergsma, which is me. We'll start with our usual call and response. So, repent and believe in the gospel. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Not bad, not bad. All right. You don't have to have an epiphany about when Christmas season ends because it's on the baptism of our Lord, which this year falls on the Monday after the epiphany of our Lord. Why? Well, since Lent starts a little earlier than usual this year, we have fewer Sundays in ordinary time to start the liturgical year. So the remaining days of January mark the beginning of ordinary time, which is represented by the liturgical color green, which like a sprouting seed is a symbol of hope. So this year, January 7th, celebrates the epiphany of our Lord. The word epiphany means a manifestation of God. The readings for the Feast of Epiphany of our Lord tell of the revelation of Jesus Christ to all people, rich magi, poor shepherds, and everyone in between. The magi from the east worship him and bring gifts of gold, a symbol of royalty and kingship, frankincense, used in worship, pointing to his divinity and priesthood, and myrrh, which represents his humanity and death. We should also present these gifts to God in our daily lives. Gold means living in Christ's wisdom. Frankincense is prayer. And myrrh is offering our daily struggles as sacrifices in union with the Lord. On the second Sunday of Ordinary Time, we are invited to respond to God's call for us, but we must be disposed to listen to His voice by seeking Him in our daily lives. There are so many voices coming from the media, politics, friends, family, and from ourselves. It, it takes time to learn God's voice through prayer and discernment. God is constantly calling to each of us by name. And so may we respond to him as Samuel does, speak for your servant is listening. On the third Sunday in Ordinary Time, we hear how Jesus' call is transformative for our lives. This transformation comes from chapter 1 of Mark's Gospel. We are called to repent, which means turn away from evil and turn toward God in love. In the first reading, we hear the call of Jonah to tell the people of Nineveh to repent. And in the Gospel, Jesus calls Peter and Andrew to repent and follow him. Their yes to this call changes their occupation from fishermen to fishers of men. Jesus also announced that the kingdom of God is at hand. And our response to this revelation is repent and believe in the gospel. For the kingdom, kingdom of, God of God is at hand. Hey, you guys had your moment already. All right, don't push it. On the fourth Monday of January, the United States bishops have declared it to be a day of prayer for the legal protection of unborn children. Because after Roe versus Wade was overturned a year and a half ago, abortion became illegal and we can all sit back and say a prayer of Thanksgiving and take a nap, right? Wrong. While the overturning of Roe v. Wade was a huge victory, it did not make abortion illegal in this country. And in fact, we've had several reversals in many states since. And thus, this should only be the start of our effort to bring lasting change in society on this issue. Something I'd personally recommend is looking into picking up this new book from Emmaus Road Publishing called My Body for You. In this book, Stephanie Gray Connors specifically dives into the common questions posed by abortion supporters. By inspiring and equipping readers to be bold in proclaiming the truth about life, Connors offers invaluable help to anyone looking to be educated and prepared to discuss the topic of abortion. So visit stpaulcenter.com to order your copy today. Highly recommend the book. Very personal to me, brothers and sisters, because I was born two years before Roe v. Wade was passed, and it was my mother's early involvement in the pro-life movement that started a chain of events that led to me actually becoming Catholic at age 30. Long story, 
but I am very passionate about the pro-life movement and highly recommend Connor's book. On the fourth Sunday in Ordinary Time, Moses foretells a mighty prophet, THE prophet, whose words have the authority to forgive sins and cast out demons. I wonder who could that be? This, of course, is fulfilled in the gospel by Jesus. We must heed his voice and live according to his word. In the readings, Jesus also exhibits his kingly dominion over Satan through the healing of the demoniac. There is nothing he cannot do. Even his name has power. In times of spiritual attack or desolation, we can repeat the name of Jesus with trust and surrender our worries to him. For the saint of the month, we are not celebrating his death, but his conversion day. He's kind of important here. You guessed it, St. Paul's conversion. It's celebrated on the 25th of January. Well, on the road to Damascus, a flash of light made Saul fall to the ground. Jesus told him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? After this encounter with Jesus, Saul went from being a persecutor of Christians to a fervent champion of the gospel. His conversion marks a turn for his life and the early church. God chose Paul to serve the Catholic literally universal church, through his preaching to both Jews and Gentiles. We believe that St. Paul should be everyone's patron because we are called to continual conversion. So why does St. Paul go from Saul in the first half of Acts to Paul in the second half? Well, Saul is a Hebrew name, meaning one who has been asked for or requested, presumably because his mother maybe prayed for his conception and birth. Paul, on the other hand, is an anglicization of Paulus, a Greek name, which means somebody who's short or small. Now, Jews often operated both in an Aramaic-speaking culture among their own people and a Greek-speaking culture in secular society. And so they would have a name to be used among Jews and a name to be used among Greeks. Often what they would do is translate the meaning of their name from one to the other. So, for example, you have St. Peter, who's called Cephas among Jews, which is rock in the Aramaic language, and Petros among Greeks, which is rock in Greek. But with St. Paul, he didn't translate meaning, but he chose a Greek name that had a similar sound. So Saul in Hebrew rhymes with Paul in Greek. But Paul also means short one or small one, and apparently that refers to St. Paul's diminutive stature. That is why he's represented by Reepicheep, if you recall, in the C.S. Lewis uh, Chronicles of Narnia series. All right, to all the dads out there, get ready for your A game, because it's time for the biblical joke of the month. <laughs> How would St. Paul advise you to conquer pride? He would say, you need to fall off your high horse. Oh, gross. All right, St. Paul actually didn't fall off a horse, you know? Go ahead and read that passage in Acts. No horse is mentioned. But in many images of the conversion of St. Paul, he is depicted as falling off a mount. Admittedly, that wasn't my best, so if you have something better, feel free to comment below. Okay, now for our next segment, Stump the Scripture Scholar. The question today is, why did Jesus get baptized? Well, this is a good question, and Pope Benedict XVI has two responses to this. First of all, our Lord was baptized out of solidarity with the rest of humanity. Of course, he had no personal sin from which to be cleansed, but he identifies himself with the rest of us who certainly do have a lot to be cleansed for. Secondly, Pope Benedict XVI insisted, the baptism was an anticipation of our Lord's crucifixion, of his passion. Think about it in being plunged into the waters of the Jordan. Our Lord was pre-enacting his burial and being raised up out of the waters. He was foreshadowing his resurrection and ascension. And that's true of each one of us because as St. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, we are buried with Christ in baptism and then raised with Christ to new life. Comment on this video with a chance for your question to be featured in next month's video. To wrap this episode up, I want to encourage you to keep saying Merry Christmas 
and keep those Christmas lights out until at least the epiphany of our Lord. We should continue to rejoice and celebrate Christ's incarnation and his dwelling in our hearts. Epiphany is rich in celebratory Catholic traditions. An idea from Kendra Tierney is to throw an international potluck on Epiphany because the wise men are thought of as coming from various countries and also to give gifts to each other just as the wise men did. In fact, in some cultures like in Spain, Epiphany is actually the principal festival for gift giving, not Christmas itself. There is also a tradition of having a king cake that has a ring or a plastic baby Jesus, and whoever receives the piece with Jesus in it gets to be king or queen for the day. Lastly, Epiphany marks the day traditionally associated with the house blessing. Using blessed chalk, the head of the house writes 20 cross C cross M cross B cross 24 on the lintel of the door. The numbers indicate the year and the letters have a dual meaning. They are the names of the Magi, Caspior, Melchior, and Baltazar, according to tradition, and also the letters could mean may God bless this house in Latin, Christus Mancionum Benedicat. The plus signs or the crosses represent, of course, the cross of our Lord. Now, it's hard to take down the decorations for ordinary time, but God gives us this season as an opportunity for growth in our spiritual lives as we approach Lent and the glorious resurrection of our Lord. The month of January is dedicated to the holy name of Jesus, which is celebrated on the 3rd of January. In Kendra Tierney's book, she encourages us to resolve to avoid the use of the Lord's name in vain and pray about how powerful the name of Jesus is. Also, there's a great book written by my friend, Dr. Scott Hahn called, Holy is His Name the transforming power of God's holiness in scripture. In this book, we can uncover what holiness really is and better understand what our relationship with holiness consists in. January is one of the gloomiest months of the year and psychologists tell us that the peak of mental depression in America is about January 25th, a month after Christmas. I know January was hard for me to get through as a Protestant, but one of the things that helps as a Catholic is that you can extend the Christmas season into January, which is liturgically appropriate, and that shortens the number of days you have to get through that lack a holiday. Also, make sure to lean into the feast days that we do have this month, like the conversion of St. Paul on January 25th. Let us end in a prayer asking for the intercession of St. Paul. Here at the St. Paul Center, we begin each morning as a staff gathered together asking for the intercessions of St. Paul in the words of this prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O St. Paul, the apostle, preacher of truth, and doctor of the Gentiles, intercede for us to God who chose you. You are a vessel of election, O St. Paul, the apostle, preacher of truth to the whole world. O God, you have instructed many nations through the preaching of the blessed apostle Paul. Let the power of his intercession with you help us who venerate his memory this day. Amen. And in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for watching Bible Basics with John Bergsma, and I hope to see you next time. May God richly bless you.